So let's jump in. So uh, doing some more on the, on the physical evidence of, of forensic situations, we're getting into fibers and fiber evidence. And so today we're going to talk about biopolymers and natural fibers, and then the, the next lecture will be on man-made fibers. And so we're going to um, focus more on the chemistry of the fibers and some of their properties. Um, and so we're going to get into biopolymerization. So uh, we're going to start with some polymer basics and get into biopolymers, natural rubber, uh, polysaccharides, proteins, and so on. And, and some of those may be natural like sources, like natural rubber is not really a biopolymer, it's a, a biosource, but then we polymerize it. So, or the natural environment polymerizes it, but not necessarily the plant. And then we get into natural fibers, cellulosic fibers and protein fibers like hair. Okay, so where does this fit into forensic chemistry? Well, fibers in general are category of physical evidence. And then we're going to be over on this chunk on the left, biopolymers, and then semi-synthetics, what we do with uh, some of the bioproducts that we take, and then we'll process them and, and use nature's chemical factory <laughs> to make fibers, sort of uh, man-made fibers from, from nature's products. And then next time we'll get into the synthetic organic fibers, and we'll talk about the different polymerization techniques that we use to make those fibers. So here's a the basics of polymer terminology, you know, you have these monomers, and in this case, it'd be a, a man-made, you've heard of polyvinyl chloride. So the vinyl chloride molecule is shown here. And in almost all, yeah, almost all of our man-made polymers feature a double bond. So this is the key for our man-made polymers. We're using that double bond functionality that we can then polymerize. Um, this one, uh, this molecule will form a random po polymer. So if we think about this chlorine being on carbon one or carbon two, it can polymerize in two different ways. So I'm going to draw this like, like I'm going to say that this molecule here equals X and that uh, a molecule with the chlorine on the, the left carbon is equal to Y. So I've just deleted the hydrogens, okay? And so this might be a polymer that has the chlorine this way, and then this way, and then this way, this way, this way, this way. Do y'all see the random nature of it? Right, and so there's no control over which side the chlorine is on as we polymerize this. So this can form a sort of a random XY type polymer. Sometimes we use A's and B's, a random AB polymer. Uh, sometimes there's a there's block polymers. And so let's... Uh, you know, think of maybe we have some polyvinyl chloride and then maybe we just have some uh, ethylene uh, molecules like this. And so this might be X, or let's make this one Y, okay, Y. And so we might have some, some polyvinyl chloride here that we polymerize up to a certain level and then we don't necessarily want that much chlorine, say maybe we want some just plain old ethylene and so then Y would be here. And so we have some, some chloride containing polymer and some non-chloride containing polymer. So we can make these up in two different batches and then mix them together and link the chains. And so that's how block copolymers are made. So a lot of times this is called a block copolymer. The example I have here is not really that realistic. A lot of times we use block copolymerization when we want to make a polymer with fine-tuned mechanical characteristics, like rigid or flexible. And so we might have some rigid polymers and we blend it in with long chains of flexible polymers. And so we can fine tune how the polymer will bend and so on. So you think about all of the different things we use plastics for, uh, everything from you know the covers of a, a basketball to something like this uh, laptop case or this monitor here. Some things we want to be very rigid, some things we want to be very flexible. And so we can we can fine tune those. So those are the man-made polymers. Some are by nature, they have to be alternating. And, and so uh, it won't polymerize unless it's alternating. And so here's one where we have a dipic acid. And this is uh, hexane diamine. I'll just call it diamine. So we have two amines here and we have a diacid. So these two acid groups here and here, 
the acids have to have to um, polymerize with the amine groups. We lose water. It's a condensation reaction. And so by definition, it's an, it's an X and a Y and an X and a Y linked together. And so whenever we have six carbons in this, so we have a hexane diamine. And then the dipic acid has four, car, four CH2s in between two carboxylic acids. That's also six. So this would be nylon six, six. So, and then it's just repeated. Uh, sometimes we can take a, a polymer that has a reactive site like the chlorine, and we can react something with one of those chlorines and then polymerize off the side. And so that would be a graft polymer. So it's kind of like we grafted a limb into a tree we graft a different polymer onto the side of, a, of an existing polymer. So this is some polymer terminology. Uh, this is a, the single unit as a monomer. Obviously a dimer would be two of those, a trimer would be three of those. If we have a few of those, we would call them oligomers. And then somewhere between oligomer and it becomes a polymer, but there's no hard and fast like break point where we say, okay, it's not an oligomer anymore, it's a polymer. So it's the philosophical question of, of, of a beard, the, the length of the beard. So if you, if you know, if you took a philosophy course in high school or whatever, if you had one in college, the length of the beard argument where, you know, if the person doesn't have any whiskers at all, he certainly doesn't have a beard. Um, if they've got two or three whiskers, is it a beard yet? No. Somewhere between three whiskers and a full beard is a beard. But just because you can't define where it transitions to a beard doesn't mean that a beard doesn't exist. So that's sort of this logical argument. Same with the polymer. Somewhere between an oligomer and a polymer, it becomes a polymer. But we don't have a, like a definition to say when it's 20 or more, it's a polymer. So then this is the different kinds of linkages. And this is really how we fine tune those mechanical properties. So this is, this is key. So mechanical and physical properties of the polymer ba are based upon these polymer linkage, linkages. So the, the individual strands of the polymer are either you know packed in in a linear manner maybe we have a graft polymer with an active site where they're coming off of that branched uh, backbone cross-linking is probably the most important piece uh, and we'll talk about that in a second and then we have these things called dendromers where we have like an active site in the middle and then the polymers all start from that active site and and these can, you know, this is a koosh ball. You ever have a koosh ball when you were a kid? Okay. Uh, you could throw it at your sister or your brother and, you know, get some aggression out, but it doesn't hurt them. <laughs> I guess it depends on how hard you throw. But um, anyway, they're fun. This really actually, this actually isn't a dendromer because uh, it just comes from the central core. So it may be like a, instead of a tri-star, it's more like, it's more like a multi-star. Um, if the individual polymers coming out from the center also branch, then it would be a dendromer. Okay. And so let's talk about cross-linking. Cross-linking is the most important tool that you can use to, make, to change the mechanical properties of a polymer. And so uh, we, this happens a lot in, um, in our biopolymers, like proteins. And so these... This might be protein structures. Which are important like in our enzymes. And these disulfide linkages, so uh, methionine and cysteine, they have these sulfur groups and those can, those can link and cross link across the protein and really hold it into a rigid shape. Um, this is important also in the in the, the twist rate and so on of our hair. And so like you can go in and get a, a permanent, permanent curl, I guess is where it comes from, uh, where they will reduce these disulfide bonds. And that's where that smell comes from. That reducing agent is nasty, okay? I can't even be around that smell, it's so bad. So they, they, they relax the hair with the reducing agent to break those disulfide bonds and they put it on the curlers and then they reestablish uh, removing that that reducing agent reestablishes those disulfide bonds and makes a permanent curl to the hair. So it's not quite permanent, but it lasts a long time. Okay, a lot longer than just using heat. Um, 
Now, your enzymes in your body also depend upon a lot of these uh, disulfide structure enabling structures. Most of the most of the shape of the um, enzymes and proteins in your body are using hydrogen bonding through those amide linkages, but the disulfides are even stronger than that. And that's where the toxicity of heavy metals comes in. These are PKSs or uh, KSPs, um, the minus log of those KSPs. So if KSP, let's do this, do this one. Um, let's look at mercury, for example, because everybody knows mercury is toxic, right? So here's mercury sulfide, and it has a, a PKS of 52.4. All right, so. That means that the KSP is, we'll just say, 1 times 10 to the minus 52.4. So it's enormous, okay? enormously small. <laughs> Uh, that's that means that once the mercury latches on to these sulfurs, it's stuck. So it's going to really disrupt the ability of that that enzyme to make the disulfide bonds and so on. So these heavy metals are so reactive to sulfur, they really screw up the function of these enzymes. And so that's the sort of the the, the main mode of function of of uh, heavy metal poisoning is messing with those sulfide bonds. And now you look at iron, you say, well, golly, why isn't iron enormously toxic to the body? Okay, it's because it's it's such a strong bonder to the sulfide is that some of these enzymes will just sequester the iron in a little sulfide, sulfur nanocrystal or, or nanostructure. And so you'll see these little iron sulfide structures in the enzyme. And so they've sort of used that uh, nature's used it to its advantage to have iron sequestered in these little sulfur uh, nanostructures to facilitate redox chemistry inside the enzymes. Okay, let's talk about the properties, the physical properties of these fibers. So at high enough temperatures, if they don't decompose, they'll melt, okay? But uh, many, of the, many of the polymers will decompose, like your nitrile gloves, they really don't melt, they just start to decompose. So they have such a high temperature resistance, they'll go up to 400 C and then they'll start to just char and react with oxygen. But a lot of polymers will melt and so you'll have this, this uh, melting point for the polymer. So a pseudocrystalline polymer will have a, a, a decently stable melting point, okay? And just below that liquid, you'll have a short-term shape memory. So what is, what is this shape memory? Well, this is a picture. You've heard of memory foam, right? You, you push down on the foam and let go and you still see the shape of your hand. So that's what we mean by shape memory. And this is short term. We hope it's short term memory foam, okay? Okay, so it's a flexible elastic, elastic polymer. You push on it and it has uh, short term shape memory. Um, there are certain points when you when you, you cool it down, maybe it has long-term shape memory. So um, if you were to cool this foam down, it would hold that hand imprint even longer. If you think about the thermal motion, that's what's gonna erase the, the memory. Um, if you cool it down below its glass transition temperature, so this is an important one here. It goes from a rubber or flexible polymer to a glass, and then it has a fixed shape. So if you were able to put an impression in that elastic polymer and cool it below its TG, then it would hold that shape. They're both solid. So both of these are solid here. But some polymers have a crystalline or even amorphous solid state. Uh, I mean, the amorphous solid state would be the glass. So this is that amorphous internal organization. And so that's why we're talking about the glass transition temperature. It's when it becomes solid. It, if it's amorphous, it's, uh, it's a glass. If it's crystalline, it's, it's crystalline. Okay. Now, the whole polymer doesn't necessarily crystallize. There may be crystalline regions. And so let's talk about crystalline polymer. Let me find it. Well, that's in the next lecture. So, so this is just the basics of, of polymer science. A uh, couple of the main points would be shape memory. Also, there's a state in here between solid and liquid, actually a couple of states. 
a, a rubber would be more of a solid that's flexible, okay? Uh, liquid is ultimately flexible, no, no integrity. It'll flow uh, and change shape at will. A gum is in between a liquid and a solid. So think of uh, silly putty, right? Silly putty has this fixed shape until you move it. You can stretch it and then it'll stay stretched. You can deform it, it'll stay deformed. So it's, it's not solid, but it's not liquid either. If you leave it on the countertop for weeks, it will relax and flow. So it's, it's kind of behaving like a liquid, but it's really slow in the way it flows. So we call that a gum. And you can think of it just like we have chewing gum, same kind of thing. Okay, now let's take natural rubber. It's really, I would call this a semi-synthetic, not really a natural polymer or biopolymer. It has a natural source. And so we get this um, isobutylene and other kinds of isoprene monomer, uh, monomers come out. And here we have those double bonds. And then we come along and we polymerize that. Okay, and we can polymerize it directly uh, with reaction with, with oxygen and so on. We can create free radicals. We can talk about that next lecture. And we'll, we'll um, polymerize this molecule, but also we can add cross-linking agents. And when you add in sulfur, that's called vulcanization, and that cross-links that rubber. And here are some, you know, farm boots, some mutters, and you can kind of see it looks really funny down here. It's just that they haven't cut off the little form stuff and so that's been squeezed out of the mold and they're going to trim that off and they're going to bond it to a sole material and then they're going to sell it tractor supply okay it's a good place to shop my daughter was joking with me she's like when was the last time you went shopping you know and i was like what i go shopping i go to tractor supply she goes that's not shopping i said but that's where i buy my jeans that's shopping if you buy jeans it's shopping right so anyway good place all right, so let's talk about the other, what I would call real biopolymers, the carbohydrates and the proteins and DNA and so on. So uh, carbohydrate has this wonderful formula that is generic for all of them. So the empirical formula for all carbohydrates is CH2O, and it's right in the name, carbo and hydrate. So it's real easy to think about that. Um, hydrocarbons are just CH, okay, but carbohydrates are carbon and water. The monomers are things like glucose and fructose. You've seen those. Uh, they, can, they can open the ring or close the ring here with this anomeric carbon. And, and this carbon can reattach with the, the OH in the equatorial position or it can be in the axial position. Okay. Uh, it forms this six-membered pyran ring. And this is really the interesting thing. Uh, this, this ring is incredibly versatile because notice instead of just the double bonds, in this six-membered ring or six-carbon sugar, we have five different places where we can polymerize. If we were doing sort of man-made polymerization using the double bonds, we'd have two. So think about the versatility. So think about a chain. If you just have a chain, it's like every link is linked to only two, two other links. But this would be a chain with five links on every link and other places where you could hook. Every link has five places where it could hook on. So we can make the craziest structures with carbohydrates. I mean, you could become, I heard a great talk when I was in the ACS local section up in the Panhandle. We have the ACS speakers come through on a circuit. And this guy was a carbohydrate chemist. I had never really thought about carbohydrates. And it was fascinating, all of the different chemistry that carbohydrates shows. I mean, just think about all of the plants, trees, Everything that nature produces, almost all of that is carbohydrate chemistry. There's proteins involved, but it's the structures of nature that are made out of carbohydrates and our food and, and, and fuel that we use for our bodies. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about this. There's different ways to draw these. We have the Fisher projection and notice all of these OHs. So the OH groups are the polymerization feature. Um, so these are, these are all of the linkages where you can polymerize this molecule, okay? And there's even at the end an OH2, okay? 
you can come around, these can react with each other and close the ring and they can close the ring. Like in this Hayworth projection, you've got all of the different chiral carbons um, and you've got different positions for the OHs, okay? And then if we put these in the chair conformation, you can kind of see the difference between the equator and the axial positions. So I'm gonna put a little star by the equatorial OHs. Okay. And then over here, you've got the axial position. So here's, this is recombined and now that OH is different. It's in the axial position. Is that much of a change? Yeah, that means you make that change and polymerize this thing and you go from a starch, something that we can metabolize for energy to a cellulose, which we can't. It's just such a simple little change and you've got completely different chemistry. So let's talk about the different chemistries of these saccharides. Um, and so this is just going through different, you know, sucrose and lactose and, and all the different ways. So you can just look at, at these and it's that one sort of, uh, you know, the, that one to four linkage that makes a huge difference. And we'll look at some of those different linkages. Also the product of all of this uh, biopolymerization. I'll, I'll have to say almost, because I don't like to always use the word all. <laughs> because anytime yes. we're Bless you. Anytime we're polymerizing two OHs, so this is a very simple thing to just to draw out, R, OH, H, O, R, we end up with R, O, R, plus H2O. See, we have, we have an extra H2O in there. We pull that out. It's a condensation reaction. Condensation because it produces water and we bond those things together. We can do the same thing with the, with the amino acids. We have the R, carboxylic acid, and then we have the amine. And so here's your water, and we make an amide linkage. <clears throat> and so here's some other uh, biopolymers. DNA obviously is a biopolymer and so are proteins, but we're going to focus on the carbohydrates because we really, I mean, I'm sure you've studied quite a bit about proteins and about DNA in your background. So let's talk about chitin. Okay. It's made up of glucosamine link linkages. So here's uh, like a glucose polymer, but it's been, uh, it's been uh, this amine and uh, acetyl group has been added to one of those OH groups. And so that's glucosamine. You've heard of this perhaps if you've gone to HEB or gotten your vitamin supplements. Okay, why, why would we take glucosamine? Well, because it also forms a, a complex called chondroitin. And chondroitin is in cartilage. And here's the chondroitin structure. <clears throat> and it's that Hayworth projection showing this oxygen linkage and it's polymerized in this way. And this is a very, because of this extra uh, amide group here, that extra hydrogen bonding can produce very rigid structures. And so it can withhandle, it can, with, uh, it can handle a lot of impact and a lot of uh, compressive force. And so that's why our cartilage has this in it. But it's also uh, the exoskeleton of insects and arthropods. So it can form, instead of going from say the, the axial position to the equatorial, it can go from axial to axial, and it can form this chitin molecule and polymerize that, and that's the, that exoskeleton on our insects, which is nasty. Okay. One of the reasons I'm not going to be eating any bugs, okay, I don't care what the World Economic Forum says. So. And so then nature stores its energy in terms of starches. So these are some new pictures. There's, uh, I put up the new sort of updated set of notes on 
on blackboard. <clears throat> and so these are granules, granules of starches, and you see this branched structure of amylopectin. And it's great for long-term energy storage. It can contain over a million glucose units. And I say it's slower storage and retrieval because you put them on the end of all of these chains instead of branching it off. So it's, it looks very highly branched, but it's not as, as branched as, um, as glycogen. So but some of these, again, can contain over a million glucose units. So that's amylopectin. Uh, this is how plants store their energy for the next um, burst of activity in the spring. So a lot of times when we have a drought, we notice this with our trees. In 2011, we had a terrible drought, and that's when all the wildfires were burning down in Bastrop and places like that. Um, and I, we had a forester come to the Rotary Club, and I was asking him about, uh, you know, if the trees are going to survive. And he said, you won't know for maybe a year or two. He said, because the, uh, the trees, they, you know, they get their energy from the sun and their leaves, and they build starch in their root structures. So they're storing energy. They're using it to, to make new growth, but they're, they're storing that energy in their starch, in the starch in their roots. And so then it's the next spring, how to push out those leaves. That takes energy. And they don't have the leaves out yet, so you can't get energy from the sun. So the tree starts to use that starch to push out the leaves. And it pushes out the leaves, and then the leaves start generating energy. And so that's the new growth that we see. But if the, there's not enough starch, like if you have a drought, then the tree can't store the energy for the next spring. And so sometimes it takes a year or two for the tree to die after it's been stressed with drought. And we saw that out at our land. A lot of the um, cedar trees in particular, we lost almost all of them, which in our, I mean, it's actually okay. I think it was way of nature giving the oaks a bit of an advantage. So the oak, the live oaks survive, most of them, but the cedar trees or the juniper is what it really is, um, took a terrible hit. And so now our, our farm kind of looks like a war zone. All the dead cedars are falling on each other and leaning over, and it's pretty dangerous. <laughs> so we're pulling them all out. So here's the uh, glycogen, sort of a faster way to store energy. And, and why would I say it's a faster storage and retrieval system? Well, because it's more, um, it's, it's got more ends. So on a given unit, there's, there's more places to read and write, if you want to think of it that way. We can, we can keep linking these on here, and there's lots of places to quickly store energy, and there's lots of ends to pull the energy off. Because the way this works is you got to pull the molecules off the end of the chain to get, get energy, and you got to put the molecules on the end of the chain to store energy. So glycogen is our, our fast storage and retrieval system for our energy. This is also kind of a dendritic, a good example of a dendritic polymer. So this is looking down uh, you know, like a fiber, you've got this protein in the middle that, that starts off the, the glycogen and then you have all of this branched polymerization. So this, is, this would be a good example of what we call dendritic growth. Dendritic growth. And then we get into nature's skeleton, the lignocellulose complex. So I've added a lot of new images for this. Um, so here's the strand of cellulose uh, showing all of the hydrogen bonds. And so the, the polymerization, these are the fibers right here. And then they're held together by hydrogen bonds. So this is like a linear polymer. I mean, of course, it could be wrapped around in, in coils and so on. But it's those hydrogen bondings of the OH groups that are holding it together with such strong force. Now that's that's like the the best possible situation for polymers and stabilizing their mechanical forces. So you've got covalent bonds holding the chains, and then the the cross linking is hydrogen bonding. Why is that great? Well, because you can break and remake hydrogen bonds very easily. So this can swell, this can shrink, this can take impact and reform. So cellulosic structures, wood, are very very strong in terms of its ability to bend and not break. So you look at plants and trees, you see them bend quite a bit. You can break all of those hydrogen bonds and give it some extra volume, and then you can reform them when it comes back. So any kind of polymer that can break and remake hydrogen bonds is going to be a strong polymer. And we'll see next time that that's the secret behind the strength of Kevlar. 
So Kevlar is a man-made polymer, but it has this kind of hydrogen bonding character that allows it to have incredible strength and impact strength in, as well. Um, cotton is probably the purest form of, of cellulose. And, and so that's, um, you know, the stem of course is lignocellulose, but the, the cotton ball is, uh, is almost pure cellulose. Inside the cell walls, this is where those cellular fibers, those uh, cellulosic fibers are, and it makes a pretty complex arrangement inside the cell wall. Now the lignans, we talk about the lignocellulose complex, the lignans are least characterized, and they are these, um, these alcohol molecules that have aromatic rings in them. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, they, you know, got they're bonded together in a complex way. And like I said, they're the least characterized thing, but they form this, this, uh, this complex of materials where you have mixture of, of lignin and hemicellulose and cellulosic fibers, you know, also, you know, tubules to carry water and so on. And, uh, and when you, when you break these down from the pulping process to make paper, a lot of these lignin molecules come out as these different alcohols. So these tree alcohols um, are big in Huntsville. That's a huge. Good old Hunts Vegas. So whenever I'm in my lab trying to make a clean surface, this is my enemy. Okay. We're in the Sam Houston National Forest. Those trees are just belching out all of these little ton of for alcohols and they're just in the air they're everywhere and so i try to clean a surface and uh when i was working with some folks that worked in the panhandle where there's not a tree to be found <laughs> okay if you find a tree in a panhandle somebody's great grandparent planted it and their grandparents watered it and their parents hopefully watered it otherwise it's dead um, and so they don't have a lot of these tree alcohols running around but we do and they said they were able to clean a surface and get a contact angle with water of 20 degrees and that's how they knew it was clean. We could never get below 40. Okay, so if you've got a metal oxide surface and you put water on it, it's going to want to spread. Okay, but if there's already molecules on there that are hydrophobic, it's not going to spread. And so we could we could put a drop of water there and get like 40 degrees contact angle. And then 30 minutes later, we put it on there and it would be 50 degrees. 30 minutes later, you put it on there, it'd be 60 degrees. I mean, the tree alcohols were just landing on that surface and forming a coating on the metal surface. So I know that's not really so much uh, related to forensics, but there's a lot of those tree alcohols and we can definitely detect them with metal surfaces. Um, another thing about the fibers is a lot of our clothing fibers, uh, carpet fibers, uh, any type of fibers in the home, sometimes they have been modified to make them fire resistant or fire retardant. Okay, specifically children's pajamas. Um, they, they don't want those to, to easily catch fire. And so they'll put coatings on there that, that do this. This is from this company that makes the fire retardant fabrics. And so they'll have a chemical coating that produces a non-combustible gas that prohibits the ignition or the spread of fiber, okay? And also reduces the toxic smoke and fumes. And so that's, I guess, and important from a forensic standpoint is because that might be an indicator that would allow you to distinguish between different kinds of fibers. Was this a fiber from a flame retardant cloth or was this a regular, like a natural fiber, um, just a piece of cotton or something like that that wasn't treated? And so it's, it's important to, to consider that our textiles aren't just made out of, say, pure cotton. There's other things added in to adjust their properties especially the colorants, okay? Some colorants are just blended into the cotton or the wool or whatever, and they're just, they're just in the matrix, and others are color fast. So color fast colors have been covalently bonded to the, the fiber. And so you can take this, this colorant molecule, let's say it's got a chloride, and you've got uh, this cellulosic polymer, you can put this in a basic solution and pull this HCl off. And so you can see that in this case, it's, a nat it's not a natural polymerization. It's a man-made polymerization, and our product is HCl. And you have this covalent bond attachment, which is going to be resistant to just washing out. So when it's color fast, it can go through lots and lots of washes, but it's held on by a covalent bond. Okay. Now, that, that can be tricky if you want to bleach this fabric. 
okay? If you bleach this fabric and the bleach is uh, able to destroy the, the color center, the triaromethine or the azo linkage or whatever it is that's giving it the color, then it's not a bleach safe fabric. But if you have a, a pigment that is not gonna react with that mild oxidizing agent of hypochlorite, then, then it would be bleach safe color, but not a lot of colors are bleach safe as you might imagine. But it uses that OH functionality, which is perfect because cellulose is just full of OH groups. Okay, let's look at this kind of uh, sort of semi-synthetic setup. So here we have cellulose, something like cotton, okay? And we go through this industrial process. We react it with hydroxide. Maybe we're using a, a solvent like carbon disulfide. And we make this cellulose xanthate, also called viscose. So, so we put this, this molecule, this CS2 type group, it looks like an analog of a carboxylic acid. Okay. And, and why would we do this? Well, because it's soluble in water. Okay. And then we could react it with the sulfate and pull that, that CS2 back off. And we've got back to our original. So we started out with ROH and we end up with ROH. Seems kind of a weird process from a chemistry standpoint. Why would we do that? I mean, we would we would uh, start with um, cellulosic fiber and end up with cellulosic fiber. And the reason we would do this is because of the physical properties, okay? So in the old days, we could make fabric out of cellulose. We could spin it, okay? But the fibers were short. They weren't very well entangled, okay? And so in order to make modern day spinning, we need a stronger fiber, we need a longer fiber, okay? We need a straighter fiber. And so this allows us to take the cellulosic fiber and use industrial spinning machines. And so we can regenerate that cellulose, make it longer and stronger and finer, and we can make, um, you know, whatever, 800 count sheets with it or something like that. Some cloth that's much, much different than the cloth we could get out of straight cotton. Uh, here's a picture of those. So cotton and other cellulosic fibers um, have this flat coiled structure. After we go through the, the cellulose acetate process, then they're, they're strong, uniform, not coiled, and so on. Now, this was really popular as in the 70s, okay? The shiny rayon fabrics. It's still cellulose. It's still, you know, started with cotton. Um, and then that kind of went out of style. I don't know if it's back in or not. Is there a style anymore? It's just crazy. Everything is individual. But but that, that rayon has such a smooth luster to it because it's been reprocessed. It went through an extrusion process into water. It's a very smooth fiber, um, super entangled microfibers. You can't even see the individual fibers. This is just extruded into threads and has a, because of the smooth surface, it has more of a shine or a shimmer to it. So that's how they're making those crazy uh, new fabrics. Okay, we can take this, uh, the cellulosic fibers and, and break them into, into chips and then pulp it, okay? And this pulping process produces, we use a lot of sulfuric acid and then it produces a lot of sulfur gases, SOX um, gases. And that stinks. Um, I say P U. Okay. Uh, but that's what they had up in the Northwest where we had a lot of forest, forestry and, and paper processes. So whenever you drive through um, Texas City, Baytown, those places like that, you typically smell refinery smells, right? And being from Texas, that was sort of home. Yeah, it stinks too, but I would I would drive through by a refinery and I would smell that that refinery smell. Okay, that's Texas. And then I got to the Northwest and that their smell is the paper pulp process. So you drive by a pulp plant, it smells rotten. They're kind of like a rotten egg, but not not exactly like a rotten egg. It's just the unique smell of the paper process. Um, and it's pretty nasty. So they want to keep the cellulose, but they want to remove all of those conifer alcohols and those things. And this this lig these lignins, all of these other molecules that are not the cellulose are pulled out and it's it's called tall oil. And I, I looked it up uh, again to refresh my memory on these things. And, and tall is the Swedish word 
Talia fir tree or pine. And so what we would call pine oil, this is called tall oil in the industry. It's a brown liquid. There's a lot of really interesting molecules in that stuff. And so this is an open area of, of science for people to use tall oil extracts and try to do chemistry with it. So, I mean, they'll pay you to take it away. So anytime you can get feedstock for free or even they pay you to take it, and then you can do chemistry with that and and create value and sell it, that's a, that's a great market. So occasionally I've been approached with people or by people who want to extract solvent molecules from the tall oil. So right now they're just burning it. They get EPA credits for like, a, um, you know, recycling. Essentially, this is a waste product. And if they could burn it, then they're at least getting the energy out of it. But it's not a, it's not a great use for these really complicated molecules because we're just pulling the energy out of it. We could do other kinds of things with it. So then once that uh, lignin is removed, then we have the cellulosic fibers and, and they're, they're bleached. We, we process them. Again, you can, you can make uh, not just paper, but, but other kinds of things, cardboard and so on. And so it's uh, the paper fibers. Here's a picture of the a microscope picture of the cellulose. So this would be these individual fibers inside the paper. Um, we have all of those. If you think about all of these little gaps here, Okay, they, if we zoom in, remember it's tons and tons of those ROH groups. And so that's what makes paper and paper products so absorbent because the whole thing is just bristling with things in the solid state that can hydrogen bond to water. So you have all of those porous sections, those gaps that can hold an enormous amount of water. Of course, you've got the fibers themselves holding water, and then you've got the small gaps that can hold water. So this is a really absorbent uh, material. And so this is, uh, I mean, this is a pretty complex fiber, and it's, it's made by nature. So look at nature's fibers. Let me go back to the cellulose acetate. I mean, looking at these two, can you see that the natural fibers are almost always well, I'll, I'll, this is one situation where I'm going to use the word always. Natural fibers are always more complex than man-made fibers. Okay. I mean, our machinery looks complex, but when you get down to it, this bottom fiber was just produced by pushing it through a hole. That's not a very complex process, right? We just took this, this goop and pushed it through a hole, and it made a nice, long, straight fiber. Not a complex process. Think about how nature makes its fibers some crazy enzyme machine comes and grabs individual molecules and puts them together. That's incredibly complex. Molecule by molecule, doing its cross-linking and all of those things in a ribosome or whatever, natural, natural fibers are always more complex than, than the human man-made fibers. And here's these multi-complex fibers like a carpet or, you know, this is really complex for mankind, right? Like this is a cross section of a fiber and I don't know, some company with the this name that starts with an S, right? Made this fiber where the cross section, if you cut their fiber, it has an S in it. That's pretty cool, okay? How did they do that? Well, they took an S-shaped cutout and squeezed the goop through the S into another deal of goop then squeezed it through a round hole into another, you know, solvent or whatever and they made the fiber with an S in the core, okay? seems pretty complex but nothing compared to nature okay this is what nature produces this is a hair okay i mean there's all kinds of things in the hair okay you've got the cuticle the cortex and the medulla all of these little cellular and fibril structures um, mostly protein structures produced by the cells and so on and so here are the different fibers and you can see some some semi-synthetics like the acetate fibers, some plant fibers like this, this uh, hemp fiber, silk or cotton, nylon fibers, orlon fibers, and then here's the hairs. Okay, it's also a very important forensic indicator. And you can tell the difference between a bunch of different animals and, and, and humans by their hair. So like the, mainly the medulla, this is, this is a big giveaway. 
like in, in the alpaca here, the medulla contains, a, you know, irregular black spots, whereas a bat hair, you know, its medulla is very regular and very large. Same with the, the badger hair, or I don't even know what a carousel is. Does anybody know what that is? Oh, yeah. Antelope, cat, okay, deer. So this is all under cross polarization microscopy. And so you would be able to tell, you know, what fibers they look very similar, say, by the eye and the outer structures. If you can shine light through them and do cross polars, you'll definitely see some internal structures of hair way more complicated than the kinds of fibers that, that we produce in our industrial processes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I think it's probably a goat. Yeah, yeah. That's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just a kid, you know. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, he's okay. Feeling gray. <laughs> it's a gray day. Yeah. And deer. So you can tell the difference between deer and antelope according to these these different things, cows and cats and so on. Um, yeah. And so let's take a cahoot and, and see if we can remember some of the main points. Yeah.